Just before COVID-19, Jatavia Gary was hitting her stride. She had art gallery shows, film festival screenings, and critical acclaim. If her name is still new to you, let this be an introduction. I'm Tom Powers, and this is Pure Nonfiction. Jatavia's main project in the last year is called The Giverny Document. What I love about this film is that it's not easy to categorize. You could call it personal, political, poetic. It makes skillful use of repurposed footage, including a performance by Nina Simone. You could say it's a film about feelings. Feelings, come on. Whoa. The Giverny document is only 40 minutes long in its film festival version, but it has many layers and many locations. One is Giverny, France, where the Impressionist painter Claude Monet cultivated his famous garden. Jatavia films herself walking through the garden's idyllic space. Another location is Harlem, where Jatavia interviews black women on the street. The setup is an homage to the classic French documentary, Chronicle of a Summer, where filmmakers ask people in Paris, are you happy? In the case of Jatavia, she's asking women, do you feel safe? Do you feel safe in your body and and in general? Um, Not necessarily, especially not in New York, because I feel like, as not only a black woman, but I'm full figured, so I get a lot of odd comments stairs and stuff like that. It's already not safe being black and women don't really get all that equality and stuff like that. Yet another layer to the film is audio from the 2016 police killing of Philando Castile. You may remember he was pulled over in his car outside St. Paul, Minnesota. The interaction resulted in the police officer opening fire. Castile's partner, Diamond Reynolds, live streamed what happened on Facebook. Jatavia is deliberate to avoid showing Castile's death. Instead, she conceals the images with her own abstract animation that recurs in her work. The Giverny document is taking a different approach than what you might expect from a documentary. She's searching for a new language for things that are difficult to express. The project exists in two forms. One is called the Giverny Suite. It was presented in art galleries in New York and Los Angeles, with three separate projectors playing different images simultaneously. The other version is the Giverny document single channel, designed to play on one screen. That's the version we mainly discuss. I first got to know Jatavia several years ago, but I'll save that story for later. I reached her this week by Zoom at her art studio in Dallas, Texas. My first question was about location. I want to ask about New York City and your relationship to New York City. You grew up in Dallas, spent 17 years living uh, in Brooklyn. Now you're back in Dallas as you're uh, finishing your current project. What is, uh, I've heard you describe in other interviews that when you were growing up in Dallas, it was um, a strongly white environment. and, uh, And so I wonder what coming to New York City meant for you. Uh, well, I mean, I, I, it was, it was mixed in Dallas. Uh, I did grow up in a suburb that was mostly white. Um, but I went home, uh, to my very, very black family. (laughs) And so there's that. And then I was also a part of a a religious community that was very black. So there's, I, I have to clarify that, you know, I'm coming from very much a Southern black experience, although my schooling you know, I was I was very much, you know, in a, in a predominantly white institution from, I would say, second grade to about 10th grade. And then I transferred to a performing arts high school in downtown Dallas that was, you know, quite mixed. They had a number of, of different types of students, black, white, many Mexican-American students. Uh, this is Texas, of, of course, and lots of Asian-American yeah. students. 
So, yeah, but New York, I always was really interested in moving to New York. I knew very early uh, that I was probably going to leave Texas and that I needed to situate myself in a space where I could continue to be an artist and continue to have a certain amount of access uh, to educational opportunities and professional opportunities and creative opportunities to continue to thrive. Because, you know, I, I was an actor as a young person and as a young adult. So it was very clear to me that I needed to leave Dallas uh, in order to continue to operate at a certain level and con continue to grow. So moving to New York was a goal of mine and it was something that I worked very, very hard to make happen. My parents were not necessarily on board with that. You know, not everybody's parents wants them to be an artist, you know, <laughs> they want you to be a lawyer. <laughs> Does anyone's parents want them to be an artist? <laughs> they want you to be a lawyer or a doctor. In, in many ways, they were supportive, but in many ways, they just thought, well, you know, what are you doing? You're throwing your life away. Yeah. But the thing is, is I had all, I'd been an artist all my life. So it's like, I didn't understand, you know, the, the need, you know, why I should switch up, you know, what being, you know, as I got older, if I've been writing stories and acting in plays and performing since I was like 12, then why on earth would I decide at, you know, 19, 18, 20 to, you know, suddenly be a lawyer? So, you know, moving to New York was, you know, there was some resistance there, but I tend to thrive under resistance. Uh, I don't know if that's good or bad, uh, but uh, if there's pushback, I, I kind of double down. It's, be it's better than crumbling under resistance. Absolutely. So I want to ask you, in the Giverny document, when you're standing on a Harlem street corner, I assume that there's some significance in you picking where you're going to be when you're asking those questions. Yes. Uh, we're standing on the corner of 116th and Malcolm X. Uh, and for me, it was very important to situate myself in a space that was historically Black and despite all of the gentrification, Harlem is still very much black. You can, I knew that I needed to talk to as many black women and girls as I possibly could in the one day that we were shooting. We did that in one day. And, it, and we also did a number of shots that are direct recreations of shots from Chronicle of a Summer, that, but you don't see them in the single channel film. You see them in the Giverny Suite, which is the three channel version of this project. So we, we basically had only a certain amount of hours because we're doing those recreations and we're doing these interviews. So, yeah, I wanted to definitely locate myself in Harlem because I know historically what Harlem represents for Black people and for the Black creative tradition. We're thinking about the Renaissance, but we're also thinking about uh, the political considerations of a space like Harlem. You had people like Malcolm X and a number of other folks, whether they were uh, Christian or Muslim, standing and speaking out, you know, on the streets of Harlem in the mid 20th century, you know, like these soapbox uh, preachers, these folks who are, you know, issue, issuing a rallying cry to the community uh, to raise their consciousness. So Harlem is really, really important when I think about uh, folks like James Baldwin and Zora Neale Hurston and you know, it's just like a hotbed of Black creativity, Black political energy. And uh, yeah, it, it was important for me to station myself there as well for practical and logistical reasons, but also for uh, conceptual and, uh, I guess, traditional <laughs> reasons, one might say. Let me ask you about the other main location in Giverny, France. Can you talk about what it was that brought you there in the first place and what was happening in the backdrop that informed this project? Yes. So I applied as an artist fellow, as a residence. This was, this was a, one of my first artist residencies, basically, uh, if not the first. And I was accepted into this really prestigious, I'm still quite shocked that they invited me there, <laughs> this really prestigious artist retreat or artist residency for the Terra Foundation for American Art in Giverny, France. And they invite a number of artists and a number of scholars, like art historians who are working on their PhDs. And I was selected for the 2016 cohort. So I went in the summer of 2016. 
And there were a few artists there. There were a few sculptors, uh, an uh, air painter, uh, and myself. And then there were about six scholars. And it was a really interesting experience because, A, it was quite beautiful. They have the Monet Gardens there, of course. They have an Impressionist Museum. Uh, it's this really kind of quaint little town with a bunch of B&Bs and beautiful restaurants and, you know, delicious food and... You know, we're in the northern part of France, about an hour away from Paris. And it's a, you know, it's a really great re residency, but it was not without its challenges. You know, I found myself really, uh, in some ways, quite uncomfortable being there as I was the only black person there. And uh, there were moments of destabilization uh, for me internally and externally because I am being met with a certain amount uh, resistance in this space. Um, but also, there were, you know, to set a kind of broader backdrop, there was a lot of violence happening in 2016, just as there is now. Uh, a lot of police violence, uh, anti-Black uh, shootings occurring, Philando Castile, um, Alton Sterling, and then there was the Pulse nightclub shooting of the man who entered into this gay club in Florida and, you know, massacred a number of people during this time. So all of this is occurring while I'm in the lap of luxury and I'm having a hard time processing it and focusing on work. Uh, and so, you know, I'm kind of spiraling, if you want the truth, while, while I'm there, attempting uh -huh. to work through the things that are going on. But, uh, you know, I did, you know, I, I ended up you know, I would go back and forth to Paris, I should say. In Paris, there was a community of younger, uh, black diasporan uh, artists, you know, folks who live in Paris, but their parents are from, you know, maybe they're from Haiti, or maybe they're from Senegal or Mali or Guadeloupe. And I'm meeting people, and I'm having conversations with them that are different from the conversations that I'm having in Giverny. And I'm able to kind of, in some ways work through what I am feeling. And it, it was difficult because I was away from my, my, tr my usual community, um, but I found some community and I was able to finally kind of decide that, hey, you're not gonna be here for too much longer and this is a pretty rare occasion. And art has always been a way for me to kind of work through the traumatic experiences of my life and the um, the difficult things that arise, you know, and 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 happen to to individuals and to communities, art has always been that for me, even as a young girl. Um, so I was able to rally basically and place myself in this garden after all of the guests would leave, because it is a a kind of tourist stop for thousands of people every day. But at six p.m., people leave. And they gave me full reign of that space to do as I pleased. Also the best light of the day. <laughs> I would say so, yeah. It was nice. It was nice. Uh, you talked about uh, Philando Castile's uh, killing that happened in 2016. And that is that becomes one of the threads of, of this piece. When I was re-watching it, it made me think about how we've seen so many portrayals of uh, black death at the hands of uh, police and different ways of covering it in documentaries uh, that it's almost as if we have to come up with new ways to uh, to frame it. Um, and I think th that that's one of the powers of, of your film is that you're coming up with a new way to frame something that might be somewhat familiar to people that that was a widely viewed um uh video at the time that uh Flando Castile's uh partner Diamond Reynolds uh took live streaming while this horrible incident was taking place with their four-year-old daughter in the back seat um can you talk about you know how you're grappling with that uh imagery and trying to um frame it in a way that helps us see it in a fresh way yeah, so that imagery is very disturbing to me, and um, I have to say I have not. It's ironic for a lot of people. They would imagine that maybe I've seen this video a lot. I have not seen this full video at all. Um, 
for me, it was important to be very careful with this video because I have a strong critique for both the news media, um, popular culture, and the documentary world and how they show the traumatic events and the deaths of not just black people, um, but native people, uh, indigenous people, anybody who is on the receiving end of structural violence and state violence are often treated, in my opinion, quite carelessly by the news media and by the documentary world, as well as, you know, everyday users on social media. So for me, it was important to withhold the image of a dying Philando Castile as he bled out in the car. Even though we are using the footage, we never see his actual death. We hear uh, Diamond, we hear the police officers, we hear the young girl in the back. We even hear a little bit of Philando. But I'm not interested in using this sort of footage repeatedly to re-traumatize members of my community. I don't think that that is a part of raising awareness. I understand that some people do believe that. They, they think that the more we see this stuff, the more that the more we are able to mount a case against this sort of state violence, this sort of structural violence from the police. And I am in, I disagree wholeheartedly. I think that there is a long history, particularly in this country, of circulating the visual portrayals of Black people dying as souvenirs. I'm thinking specifically of lynching photos. Um, and I understand that in the past, you know, people like... Well, th those lynching photos for people who don't know, were made into postcards uh, in um, in the, the earlier part of the 20th century. Yes, they were made into postcards. White people who would attend lynchings would leave with pieces of the corpse, um, but they would also be able to send postcards to pe members of their families or community who did not make it to the lynching. So for me, I feel as though these public executions, which is what they are, are an extension of this type of tradition, this very vile uh, tradition that America is continuing to engage in. I mean, we a man was shot seven times, Jacob, like last night, you know, in his back. His children were in the car. So this is not anything new. I think that there's a sector of the society that feeds on this imagery and they need it. For me, it was important to interrogate that, interrogate this sort of bloodlust and to withhold it and to make, to force the audience to fill in the blanks for themselves and to sit with the absence of that imagery, but with the harrowing audio of the imagery. I think, I think that that is enough, right, to make a case against this. I don't think we need to see this repeatedly. I want to ask you about another element uh, in this piece, which is um, this archival footage of Nina Simone uh, from 1976 in a concert um, playing the song Feelings. Trying to forget all my feelings of love. God damn. I mean, you know, what, what a shame to have to write a song like that. Feelings, I'm not making man fun of the man. I do not believe the conditions that produced a situation that demanded a song like that. It's such an interesting piece to watch because she's deconstructing the song. You really see her musical virtuosity on display. It's, and but it's hard to tell if she is doing it out of respect for the song or contempt for the song or the, or what you know, her, her relationship to the audience was um you know always a complicated uh one um i wonder what do you see in that piece and and uh, what called out to you to to use that yeah her well first of all she's very dear to me this artist nina simone i think that, that uh 
the way she handles source material is is something that really interests me. I have a deep investment in her virtuosity, her creative and performance prowess. I think that she's quite rare and brilliant. Uh, and the way that she is able to reconstruct, to deconstruct, but also reconstruct someone else's song is really fascinating and exciting to me. I don't know if I see contempt for the song. I think I see a kind of critical engagement with it, though. Like, I think she okay. understands that this is a popular song that, you know, this song is considered... Well, let me not say what it's considered. I don't know what people consider it, but I know that I would see it as a young girl on Family Matters, you know, the sitcom with Steve Urkel, same feelings, you know, and it was almost like a joke, you know, so to right. see her take it and to soar to such, you know, such heights, but to also bring us plummeting really low, you know, it, it, I feel like the the entire performance is a kind of emotional tour de force, a kind of roller coaster she's taking us on. And what's, what stood out to me was that we see the full depth of a Black woman's internal life, like her emotionality being portrayed on screen. And that was what I was getting at. That was what I was hoping to illustrate with this work in particular, um, to render Black women as fully formed uh, and substantial subjects not just uh, flat archetypal tropes, which we often see in popular media and in Hollywood films and, you know, everywhere. So to me, she's giving us the full breadth of her humanity here. And she is, in some ways, critical and confrontational with the audience, <laughs> which I think is also really important for a lot of people to understand that... Many performers, especially if you are a performer of a group that has been historically subjugated and uh, historically dominated, that even though you are brilliant, even though these people are paying to see you, in their minds, the power dynamics are structured in a certain way. You know, they're different mm -hmm. from how you may mm -hmm. be structuring the power dynamics in your mind. So I think that she is wrestling there with the audience. Um, I think she's always had a complicated relationship with her audience, but that's what makes her so fascinating and interesting. She's demanding a lot from them. They are not simply there to receive, right? They are there to also give. They've got to give something up too. It's not just her flaying herself emotionally for them. Uh, she's not just there simply to perform. I think she understands that this is an exchange and that she wants the audience to understand that as well. I never thought about this before until you just made this connection for me that what Nina Simone does in taking other songwriters' materials and transforming it um, is akin to your process of uh, taking found footage um, and transforming it. I wonder if you can talk about, I, I, I know you are, are a big collector of archives and kind of what that means in your work and uh, the inspirations you get out of, um, out of other pieces. Yeah, I'm really inspired by uh, archive, particularly historical archive, but not just, you know, I also like contemporary. I'm, all, I'm on YouTube all day too, just like everybody else. And I'm scrolling <laughs> incessantly um, on social media as well, you know, really looking and seeing. Um, but I'm, I'm really inspired by uh, images of the past, particularly performances from the past. Uh, in some of my other films, you, we've had theatrical kind of performances of a, mo of a monologue that was originally a, a slave narrative. I'm just really, I think it's, for me, it may be the texture of this old footage from the past and the feel of it. It feels as though there's still, and this may be a little woo woo woo, but it feels like there's still like spirit there. Even though the people in the imagery in the frame are long gone and the technology has moved on, but there's still this kind of life force that's present, you know, from the material. So whether I'm working with it by hand, scratching and etching, on 16 millimeter film or whether I'm editing it in a kind of digital context, I, it is, there is an exchange that's happening with myself, the author, the author of this work, and with the 
the people and the images and the events that are portrayed within this archival material. I'm also really critical of the archive. I understand that it's not this objective, you know, collection, this uh, aggregation that's free of biases. Biases, it's absolutely not. It's another uh, construction based on the dynamics of power and money and, you know, control and gender and race and all of these other things that kind of shape our society. So in many ways, when I engage with the archive, I'm attempting to reclaim something that I feel like that has been lost or something that has been erased. And I want to put it in conversation with either myself or the images, the figures, the people that I have filmed or captured, right, in the contemporary. So I've said this before and I'll say it again, it's a conversation across time. Um, it's me attempting to write myself, my family, my community into the records, right? To disrupt the records, uh, to reclaim the records in some regard, and because the archive is not objective. I wanna ask you about the direct animation that you do on this footage. Uh, I, I read when you were talking about a piece that's less than two minutes long you did called Ecstatic Experience, which is you're drawing upon different footage, but including this film of Ruby D. And I read that you took two months to uh, do the, um, the added direct animation visualizations onto uh, this piece. Um, can you talk about the you know, the, the labor involved in that? Yes, but just to clarify, an ecstatic experience is about six minutes long. The Ruby D portion alone is about two minutes. What was on Twitter was a, a, the, the Ruby piece, which I use as a trailer. And you're right, it's a little under two minutes long, but that particular piece, I began to etch and to scratch and to manipulate the surface of 16 millimeter film in 2015. Um, I would come home from work. I was working as an assistant editor for a noted filmmaker, and I, but I would come home and work on my own projects, partly because I was, again, attempting to work through some emotional um, baggage, I should say, or the emotional response that the moment, the current moment was dictating. And the current moment looks very much like uh, the our moment right now, one of uh, political distress and uh, violence from the state. So yeah, I came home and I would commit a certain amount of hours every day to watching this clip over and over again and etching directly onto the surface, right into the emulsion uh, and responding to what she's saying. So Ruby D is the actress. This is um, a dramatization of a slave narrative which was collected by the WPA back in the 30s, I would say. They went around interviewing formerly enslaved people. And so what Ruby Dee is performing is a real life account of a woman named Fanny Moore. And so I am responding to what Ruby Dee is performing. So around her face and in the frame, it's basically just one close up of her as she details this account. And I am etching and drawing a box. You know, there's a cube around her head at some point. Some, at some point there's a halo. Some point there's this kind of like starburst that look like a kind of cosmic material almost. I don't know how to, <laughs> how to say it. Um, at some point I'm scratching her out and removing parts of her face. Uh, and I think the labor involved is I mean, this is women's work. I saw I saw it very much as women's work at the time because you know, I was thinking about an earlier film I did with Simone Lee and it's titled Women's Work and she speaks about the kind of repetitive process uh, that is inherent in her practice. She's an artist and in that film she's making these small roses out of clay. Yes, and these roses go on larger cowrie shells, also larger busts. And uh, she's talking about this legacy of women's work that is often downplayed as craft or, you know, you know, downplayed as lesser art. And for me, but, but for her, it was something that was really incredible and a real, a real staple 
in her practice because it helped her think through the larger considerations of her work. You know, the things like black feminine subjectivity, you know, these kind of heavier concepts and ideas. And so that's what, in many ways, the etching became for me. This repetitive process where I got to empty my brain and it felt very meditative and thoughts and ideas could come freely. I am, resp I am dancing, I'm responding to the footage. And it's a quiet practice that's very meticulous and laborious and time consuming because we're going frame by frame, but it's super involved and rewarding. Uh, and it's intimate, it's a very intimate exchange and I feel like you can feel that when you see it. I wanna ask you about uh, the New Negress Film Society, a collective of six black women filmmakers that, uh, that you're a part of. Um, can, can you talk about you know, the motivations behind that. It's six black women, and it was initially started in 2013, I believe. It's, I'm getting old. And the original founding members were a woman named Kumi James, Nuatama Badomo, um, Nevlin Naji, and myself. Kumi and Nevlin are no longer a part of the collective, but they helped definitely lay down a lot of the conceptual framework for the collective and our method, the method to our, or the reasoning behind us collectivizing was because we wanted to create space for ourselves and for other black women filmmakers like us who found that things were a bit difficult, you know, in graduate school or, you know, as you were trying to make your way through the quote unquote industry, we wanted to make space for exhibition, for consciousness, raising. Uh, we wanted to create a space where we could workshop our materials with one another and get quality feedback that was constructive, that didn't feel denigrating. We wanted, we wanted feedback from people who understood our lived experiences, and we wanted to be able to provide that space, a safe space for creativity, for workshopping, for sharing. Uh, and the, the space has expanded in, throughout the years. Uh, we have several members now, um, Stephanie Santange, an amazing Haitian American filmmaker out of New York, Chanel LaPonte Pearson, a really great filmmaker and producer also out of New York, Yvonne Shirley, an incredible director, writer, producer, archival producer, um, Nuatama Badomo, who I'm sure you know. Uh, she's one of my favorite filmmakers, uh, a Ghanaian American, filmmaker who did Afro Knots and is currently working on a feature version of this. Well, I mean, I'll tell you, I, I knew some of those filmmakers, but I didn't know all of them. And I thought a real strength in that collective as, as an outsider approaching it was by coming to it through you, I got to discover all these other filmmakers. So that that's just my own perspective. I'm sure there's many greater strengths that come uh, f uh, from an, inside the group. I think that's true. I think that, even, like, say you might know Nuatama, but you don't know any of the rest of us. And so you come and you find out about the space and then, bam, you're introduced to, you know, five more really talented individuals who, you know, may not have the same visibility, but are really, really potent artists, like really strong artists who have their own voices. And we're expanding. We are in the process of bringing in more members and figuring out how we can continue to serve our community because we have a black women's film conference that we've done in the past and how can we meet the challenges of this current moment this covid moment and still bring the kind of programming that people have grown really accustomed to us to seeing from us um, so i would encourage folks to look out for more more programming that you know is, is flexible in this really difficult time but uh, but is open and, and responsive and focused on bringing you, you know, more work from people that you might not have heard of, but that you should definitely know. Definitely. Now you've now you're back in Dallas. You moved back to Dallas in the last year. Um, what has that been like for you? <laughs> I'll keep it brief. Um, I moved back here in September before COVID. I should say that I did not run from New York because of COVID. <laughs> I was actually in Boston the year before I had a fellowship at Harvard. And then I decided to come back here because I'm focused on a feature film project that really centers my family. It's a kind of ancestral excavation of sorts. I'm looking at my close relationships, my foundational relationships. 
And it has been with not without its challenges. You know, there's something great about returning home to the source. You know, there's something very energizing about it. But there's also something very difficult, you know, about having to contend and confront, you know, the things that you were running away from, you know. So that's very much what the film is about. It's a feature documentary film, an autobiographical film called The Evidence of Things Not Seen. And it's currently in production. And um, I'm excited about what this time is granting me, as difficult as it is. It's a time for real interior inspection and uh, real care and quietude. So I'm using that to, to move forward with this very, very important project. I want to thank Chatavia Gary for speaking with me. Her film, The Giverny Document, continues to play at film festivals. You can follow her work on her website, chatavia.com. You can read about her collective at newnegrisfilmsociety.com. See our show notes for the links. And does your audience know that you were my producing professor? <laughs> you know, I I was, I mean, that could be a whole other, th- th- those were questions I was afraid to ask. So that's how Chatavia and I first met. She was a student at the School of Visual Arts MFA program for social documentary. I was one of those grad school teachers that must have inspired her to seek more useful points of view by turning to her peers. No, no, you weren't, you weren't bad at all, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that. Thanks to our team, series producer Hannah Nordenswan and web designer Cross Strategy. Our theme music is composed by Andre Williams and our executive producer is Rafael Nehausen. I'm Tom Powers. You can follow me on Twitter at T-H-O-M Powers. You can read our show notes and sign up for our newsletter at purenonfiction.net. <laughs>